It is December and we have returned to the west coast of Scotland after an extraordinary 2020. You might think this stunning corner of the UK had escaped the impact of Covid. Not a bit of it. Summer tourism gone, hunting tourism gone. With no clients on the hill, it's left Neil and Stevie with a lot of deer to shoot for no or little financial reward. I was heartbreaking, you know, our income fell. As a business, we had to stay on our feet, but everybody suffered. It wasn't just the venison trade, it wasn't just local hospitality. Actual guys who are friends who I've worked with for many, many years have probably had financially the toughest year of their life. They're not alone. On this trip, Neil is taking us to meet some of the people who depend on an income from Red Deer. I am forecasting right now zero sales between the 1st of January and the 30th of June. No, sir. Yep. That's the way you're working. That's the way I am forecasting to make sure that us as a business can cope with that. We will find out how their livelihoods have been affected, how the countryside fell quiet, flourished and was then abused. They just trashed the place. How government, charity and NGO staff abandoned their posts and how well-meaning national policies just don't stack up on the ground. Whatever we're doing on the edges to try to ameliorate that impact is greenwash. This is Red Deer in the year of the pandemic. It's the end of 2020. Neil has work to do. He says there's only been three dry days in the last three months, so he's dressed for success. So today, David, it's a kind of a blend of uh, ancient and modern, traditional bits of kit and some new stuff. And uh, the idea is to remain warm and waterproof throughout the day. Let's see how we get on. I'm always upset you're not wearing a kilt, to be honest. Well, there are some people that want to wear kilts, but these days with ticks and Lyme disease, <laughs> there's an awful lot at stake there that I'd rather not have ticks embedded in. <laughs> Today's job is to stalk and take deer from a coastal site being prepared for tens of thousands of new trees. The groundwork has been done in readiness for deciduous woodland. The problem with planting, particularly on wet ground like this, on PT wet ground like this, is actually, you could say, getting the young trees head above the water. And, and the benefit of a hinge mound, and Sir Jock Sterling Maxwell, when he bought the Karawa, uh, he did a lot of work on, on trying to establish woodlands on uh, ground like this. They came up with a solution that if you turn the turf over, and you can see that's a digger bucket has pulled that out, that that gives the tree some height, and underneath it, you've got the, the breakdown of this stuff, of the vegetation rotting down, and also the area underneath. So when the young tree is set in there, it on, not only is its feet out of the water, but it's also got a burst of nutrition to get it away. Deer and young trees don't mix. And no matter what you do, the deer can't be shooed away. They're hefted here. It's in them. GPS meets DNA. Hinds typically, from where they're born, they'll heft sort of three to five miles. So it's sensible and it's probably kinder for the animal that if this has been the centre of its, its, you could say, from where it was born, this has been the centre of its range of where it's lived, then having dispossessed it of this area of ground and deer won't really be able to be in here for the next 20 years, then uh, it makes sense to remove them. It's, it's of limited value, you're driving them out and just to increase the density outside, particularly when hinds in particular, because they've been hefted here, they'll go round and round and round until they get back in again. So the intention is just to take them away. This woodland project is 10 months behind because when COVID arrived, everything stopped. Furlough stopped the excavators in their tracks here. It also broke the food chain. So Neil wants us to meet some of the other people that are part of that chain. Let's start with the game dealer. So we're here at the top of the Dornoch Firth, David, going into Argyle Game. They've been here since 1982. 
a big uh, processor for venison from Rosshire, Sutherland, Caithness, and like everybody this year, really hard hit by COVID. And uh, we've been talking about COVID and the impact on natural resource management, what it means for deer management. And hopefully here we'll get a bit of insight as to what has been going on and probably an encouragement for us all to eat more venison. So we'll take a turn in and see what happens. After 15 years of working here, 2020 was the first year that Rory had taken charge of the family business. What a start. He was already bracing for Brexit and then Covid appeared. Covid's been an absolute nightmare uh, and the amount of people around here that aren't working. And for me, I guess, I guess the easy option would have been to, you know, just reduce numbers, uh, reduce orders and, and just have an easy year and build up next year. But, you know, we've been going for 1982, as I said, it's a family business and it's very important for us to, to be able to keep these guys on. I mean, I had this discussion with them yesterday. You know, I'm generally doing 78 hours a week to pick up new customers, to pick up, pick up any sales I can to be able to, to keep these guys on. And we've been lucky enough not to have to lay anybody off. We've still got the full, full working complement that we normally do. And um, when we get to the 1st of January, we'll be looking to keep these guys on. And it's going to cost us a lot of money to do that. But it's important. Uh, it's the same with our, with our suppliers. The majority of the people we work with, we've worked with for, for, for 30 plus years. And I, I'd like to think it's because we're doing a good job, because we're, you know, we, we have a really good working relationship built on trust and honesty. I mean, if any of them have any questions or want to ask anything, you know, they do. And, and we tell them there's no cloak and daggers, there's no smoke and mirrors. You know, we try and be as transparent with everything. And it's about building friendships as well as business relationships. And that's, that's, that's what it is. With a life. Neil's brother Robbie lives close by and That's supplies Ardgay game, but not with much this year. It's costing him nearly as much to shoot it, extract it and deliver it as he's getting for the carcass. His income has dropped significantly with no demand for venison and no clients to take onto the hill. 2020 has been an interesting year for us David because I, like a lot of people in the Highlands, run a small service company that delivers land and deer management services. And quite a lot of our income stream comes from the fact that we let some hunting to clients and we benefit from the sale of venison. And both of these things have been almost completely destroyed by the COVID situation. And unfortunately, approach taken by government, which means that there's been very little support for people who run little limited service companies like ours. It's not just the game processing business that's been hit. Rory's brother Andrew had worked hard to establish three restaurants, two in London and one locally. It's been a heartbreaking turn of events. The one up north, just half an hour north of us, that, that, that's closed. Um, for good? A, yes, for good. Uh, the biggest one, which was in the city, a, it's, it's completely shut, uh, it's finished, a, that was yeah, reliant on, on uh, people working in finance, Monday to Friday, that's when it made its money. And they're all working from home. So what do you do? It hit home to me when I went up to the place up there with a van and, and was emptying it out. And it's, it's very final and it's, he's not just lost his restaurants. I mean, he's got, he's got everything on the line, you know, he's got, yeah, he's signed, he's signed his, signed his life away and, uh, that's what it is at the end of the day, you know, it's people's lives, people's livelihoods. We've heard about the food chain. Now Neil wants us to meet someone who saw the best and the worst of lockdown. First, we take a quick trip down memory lane. Come on then, let's hear the story. Well, we're, we're on our whistle stop tour of the Highlands and it, and it just struck me, David, as we were going along, that I remember coming here when this was the Spinningdale Hotel many years ago with my brother. And one funny story comes to mind that we were always quite excited that when we came here, the the guy that ran the hotel did a, a, an amazing thing that we loved as kids called a knickerbocker glory. And I can remember coming in here with my father and uh, him ordering one for myself and my older brother. 
and then when it came to payment there were other people that sat in the in the in the hotel and uh, the guy told my father how much it was and he dipped his hand into his tweed waistcoat pocket and brought out a couple of sets of Heinz tusks which are ivory teeth in the in the upper jaw of a deer and put the Heinz tusks on on the counter of the bar and uh, the guy lifted the tusks up thanked him opened the till put the tusks in and gave my father change and to this day i can remember the people sitting in the corner <laughs> in complete horror looking at it. this man has just paid for these ice creams with deer's teeth they had value yes i mean things that have changed and, and it's it's inadvertent sort of impact and things at, at that time there was a whole host of what they call perks or byproducts and uh, keepers always things we've spoken about about in the past they would get a better bounty on the animal's tail on on its pizzle and uh, on the tusks and these were always things that the guys got and at the end of the year i think as i remember then i think it was two or three pounds for a set of heinz uh, tusks and probably up to five pounds for a good set of stags tusks and what year was this I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm old now, so I'm, oh. I'm trying to think when this was. But £5? But, pounds. Yeah, but that would probably be, that would have been in the 1970s. They must have been huge ice creams. Yeah, well, they were great, but I remember they were. <laughs> I mean, obviously, as you're a kid, everything seems huge, but then they seemed that sort of size. Stags lost this year, just short of £15,000. We do... On an average year, we do about 7,000 kilos of venison away to the game dealer. So that puts me at about eight or 9,000 pounds down if I shoot the same amount of deer. We're about 30-something thousand pounds down now. Mike Holliday is head keeper at Glen Ample. He's been here for more than 30 years. He thought he'd seen it all before. Well, it's a chance to catch up at the end of what's been an unusual year, Mike. <sighs> Hasn't it just... I mean, you think you've got everything covered. You've got your client base, you've got all your bookings. And then, something you've never dealt with before. I've had roads wash away, bridges collapse, things like that, but never anything like this. Just been strange to say the, to say the least. But, where we live, damn sight luckier than a lot. Yeah, I'd agree with that, absolutely. Lockdown did wonders for the wildlife. Golden eagles nesting close to footpaths. No dogs to disturb ground nesting birds. It was like, oh, I know you, so I'm not going to bother moving. Deer sitting out in the middle of the day next to the track. Even our friends, the pine martins, out in daylight. Just not bothered, out along the footpaths everywhere you went and for the birds and that it seemed such a cracking breeding season for them to me that was the incredible thing about the spring and then as lockdown eased the incredible thing was <coughs> on the not so nice side was the walkers then that were coming out they just trashed the place they would come, disappear, and whatever they'd got with them, their empty cans of Red Bull, were left all over. Didn't see a ranger. Every one of them was furloughed. And as things lifted, we were still on the ground, dealing with, not wildlife problems, as you would normally deal with, but what would be people problems. Neil also saw visitors behaving badly. Chemical toilets being poured from bridges into the burns. He even had to clear away an abandoned tent used for days as an open latrine. Somewhere people that come and trash the countryside need education. And that's the governments need to step in and start looking now at what goes on when they're let loose and there's nobody to control them. And again, if the people who live and work there disappear, the place will be trashed within a couple of years. As Mike says, education is key. If people have found a new love for the countryside, they need to respect it. It's a cliche, but to these guys and most hunters, that comes naturally. And most importantly, they stayed on the ground when others didn't. 
back to trees and deer, and ecologist Cathy Main has her own ideas about what needs to be done to save the planet. It's got little to do with planting trees in a wet, cold, dark corner of the planet. The only way that we are genuinely going to save the planet, to create a better future for ourselves and everything else that inhabits this planet, is to stop consuming. Whatever we're doing on the edges to, to uh, try to ameliorate that impact is greenwash. It's just messing about at the edges. It, it doesn't impact on the basis of our consumption model. That has to change. Changing from fossil fuel cars to electric cars feels like it's great, saving the planet, but it's not because there are massive costs of production of electric vehicles and they still have to be fueled. It's not, it's not stopping doing it, it's changing how it looks that makes us feel okay about doing it. Neil is finally catching up with those deer. There's a really strong wind, but he deals with tricky conditions every day. There's two stags at the end. Yeah, but they're all backside onto me at the moment. She's heading back the other way now, the bosom. Yeah. Not a lot I can do with that, David. Following your right or not? Sorry? Following your right? Um, yep. I'm just thinking. From Neil's shooting position, the two hinds stand clear of each other. You know? On the right, yeah. Yep. That's the advantage of the short magnum. Even when you've got a little bit of a headwind like that, the, the lighter bullets, I'm always quite nervous of them drifting with the wind. With the short magnum there, it's a good flat round. And uh, even with a bit of a crosswind like that, it's tickety-boo. Bit of a crosswind? Yeah. <laughs> And I mean, you look in the Highlands. That bit of a crosswind is a freaking gale elsewhere in the country. Yeah. Well, you saw that today, I and mean, that's uh, straight to both shoulders and down she's gone. And all, I, all I did there, well, I just clicked the ballistic target up, so I know exactly what I'm on. Yeah. So I just clicked it up five to the first mark, and it's absolutely bang on. So it was about two twenty. So I'll put it back down to zero. Nice simple system to work, that's what I like about it. Nice simple system to work. It's a lot to be said for it, a lot to be said for it. So we'll go down and tidy this one up and that'll do us for a windy, rainy day like today. You've made me work for it, that's for sure. You yeah. made me work for it, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was ready to go half an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a job needs doing. But that demonstrates the scope in that perfectly. Low light. Yep, low light. I'm quite chuffed with that. Grand. So she's something we can't see because she's lower than ground level with all the grasses. How the hell did you find her? Right. So what we did is we took a white mark. You see the rock on the skyline? There's a white mark on the rock face at the top. Right. Okay. And then directly at your back, there's a small nolly with a flat rock on the top. Yeah. And behind you is a rock with two white marks on it, straight behind my back. All right, yeah. See That's it there? Good. So what I do is I, I triangulated her between the three points okay. and then made my way for where all three lined up. And usually it gets you in the right spot, there or thereabouts. 
particularly in long heather and high grass like that, it's a handy thing to do. So we'll just get this lady sorted and we'll... She's a big animal. She is. I mean, normally a big hang like that, but again, as we've been talking about all day, this area is going to be fully enclosed, it's going to be mounded and planted, and uh, she's been hefted here all her days. So what can you do? Because all that will happen is you'll push deer like this out, and an area of this size, she'll just find her way back in again. So it's far better this time of year, they're in season, the young trees are just starting to go in the ground, and uh, I'm a great believer with deer that you're better to be proactive than reactive. So it's better to make a decision, get a good idea of the number of hinds using this area, and then uh, remove them, that's all you can do. You've dispossessed them of this area of land they've lived in all their days, what else can you do? If you don't, and a lot of people do push them out, and maybe on ground where it's not as high and rocky round about, and there's other places they can go and shelter, that's fine. But if you're taking away wintering ground, which is where the predominantly woodland is established, then really deer that rely on it for wintering, it's more humane to remove them to, than to chase them out. Lessons, the, this disconnect between the public and the private sector can't continue. It's not good for the land, it's not good for the rural economy, it's not good for our wildlife. And, and that, that was probably the challenge of COVID because an awful lot of this isn't going to go away overnight. 2021 isn't going to be the game changer. I think we're three or four years before this is over. And, uh, and that's provided that vaccines and things like that work. But the climate's changing, we're under huge pressure. And it's a plea to people, maybe two that should come out of me that from, from what we've seen and what we've done the last few days. Let's make wiser use of our natural resources, even right down to making sure that when you can, venison's on your plate because that will keep a lot of the, the deer side being successful and they'll keep that iconic species where it should be. But, but more importantly, let's, let's make sure that we all collectively say that we need better collaboration. We can't have the disconnect. We, we need to have charities, the public sector and the private sector all pulling together to deliver a sustainable future.